What's up, people? Joe Winko here, your favorite Hawaiian guy. Right now, I am back in the city of Orlando, Florida. It was actually a stranger who I met online who sent me a Megabus ticket here. And right now, I'm visiting a park called Eola Park, right by Lake Eola. So in this video, I'm going to show you guys Eola Park and show you some spots around Eola Park. And I'm also going to tell you some facts about Eola Park as well. So let's get this party started. The whole reason why I'm doing a video at this park right now is because the stranger who brought me to Orlando, or who sent me a Megabus ticket to Orlando, whatever way you want to think of it as, he told me that he was going to be busy with something else right now, so he said meanwhile I should go to this park and film a video about this park, so that's what I'm doing right now, in case you're all wondering. So to be completely honest with you guys, I honestly do not know much about Lake Eola or Eola Park. I actually didn't even know that it actually existed until the stranger brought me here. But I was able to pull out my cell phone and read on Wikipedia some information about Lake Eola and some information about the Lake Eola Park. What I found out was way back in the late 1800s, there was this really, really rich guy. His name was Jacob Summerlin. He's the owner of the Summerlin Hotel. He donated a large chunk of land to the city of Orlando for them to establish a park. And they did end up establishing a park, the chunk of land that he donated. And they called it Lake Eola Park. I also read that Jacob Summerlin and his sons they named Lake Eola after a woman that they met. And I don't really know much about the woman named Eola, who this park is named after, and who this lake is named after, but all I know is that she knew Jacob Summerlin and his son, so that's why they named the lake after her. Later on, I read in another Wikipedia article that Lake Eola was actually named by Judge Robert L. Summerlin, who was the son of Jacob Summerlin. Robert L. Summerlin was also the mayor of Orlando, Florida. The Wikipedia article that I read that day at Eola Park didn't state this, but with further research that I later did, I found out that Lake Eola was named after Robert's fiance who passed away before he could marry her. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to find out much information about her. I couldn't even find a picture of her at all. But this is what I imagined she looked like. This video is dedicated in memory of Eola, the woman who this beautiful park and lake was named after. In case you're all wondering, the actual woman in this picture is Lucy Hale. I seriously hope that one day they name a lake after me, Joe Winko, and call it Lake Joe Winko. <laughs> That'd be so awesome. Actually, in my SimCity 4 gaming series, the United States of Joe Winko, there actually is a lake named Lake Joe Winko in the Florida section of the United States of Joe Winko at the Joe Winko capital city named Lake Joe Winko. However, that lake actually exists in real life and in real life that lake is actually called Lake Obachogi. That's actually another place I've been wanting to visit for a while. But that is a whole nother topic that I'll do in another YouTube video later on. And this area didn't officially become a park until year 1888, one year before I was born in my previous life. But as I said earlier, that is also a completely separate topic that I'll be covering in another video on my YouTube channel. So make sure to subscribe if you haven't yet. 
and there's a sign right here, and let me read what it says. Okay, the John R. Mott House site, built in 1920, the former house at 528 East Washington Street was once home to Nobel Peace Prize winner John Rayleigh Mott, 1869 to 1955. As General Secretary of the National War Work Council, a World War I era Young Men's Christian Association, YMCA, oh, that's also a song by the Villagers, program, Mott received the Distinguished Service Medal for his relief work for prisoners of war. Mott served as a general secretary of the YMCA International Committee from 1915 to 1928 and president of the YMCA World Committee from 1926 to 1937. As a leader of many civic and Christian organizations, he traveled abroad and delivered thousands of speeches. He averaged 34 days a year on the ocean for 50 years and crossed the Atlantic over 100 times. Oh, wow, that's impressive. And the Pacific 14 times. Oh, like, okay, that's really impressive. The Pacific Ocean is massive. Known to, the tra known to travel plainly, he refused a ticket on the Titanic to sail, instead on a less extrav extravagant ship. Well, that was a good choice because the Titanic sank, as you guys all know. So long story short, that house over there is actually not the John R. Mott house. Uh, the real John R. Mott house was torn down. So the only thing I can say about this house that they have right here is that it's called the Eola house, according to that one sign that's way over there. Also, according to this sign, this house right here is actually the park office for Eola Park. But I definitely thought it was the John R. Mott house at first, because it does look kind of old school, really. But when you get close enough to it, you notice that it doesn't look very old school. It's just like seeing an old woman walking down the street, and when you walk close enough to her, you realize that she's actually not old at all. I'm not sure if anyone actually experienced that before, but there's a first time for everything. Usually it's the other way around. So yeah, it makes a lot more sense now. Yeah, I was actually confused about that at first, but I'm pretty sure I'm not the first person to get confused about that. Beauty of having autism. I honestly think it's really cool that he crossed the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean that many times. I honestly wish that nowadays they still would do ships across the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean like that. Nowadays, they still do have cruise ships and everything, but on a cruise ship, the whole point of a cruise ship, it's not really to get you from the USA to Europe. It's more just to do a tour of stuff that they want to show you and everything, and you only get like a limited amount of time at each stop and everything. And basically the whole point is when you get on a cruise ship, they go across over to Europe, you get like a couple of days at each place, then you have to get right back onto the cruise ship and then go where they want to go. It would be so much easier if they had like a cruise ship service that would just get you across over to Europe. You do everything you need to do in Europe and then you can just get on the next cruise ship that goes back to the USA. I really wish that was possible, and it probably is. Do you guys know of anything like that? Let me know in the comments of this video. But either way, I'm way too broke to get on a cruise ship <laughs> from the USA to Europe. That'd be awesome if I could though. I don't know, maybe a stranger I meet online will do that for me. That's exactly how I got to Orlando. But yeah, whatever. So right over there, right behind me, that's the playground section of the park. Another interesting fact about this playground right here, according to this sign, this playground is dedicated in memory of the Orange County boys who gave their lives in the World War, erected by the Orlando chapter daughters of the American Revolution 
aided by the patriotic citizens of Orange County, 1924. May they rest in peace and may they never be forgotten. And right over here is Lake Eola. So let me show you guys a closer look at Lake Eola. Let's head over there right now. So right now I'm standing on the south side of Lake Eola. There it is right behind me. This lake has a surface area of 23 acres. I'm not exactly sure how big an acre is, but that's something that I'll have to look up later. And the lake itself is 23 feet and eight inches deep. I had to double check that a couple times, but it's easy to remember because I'm actually 23 years old right now, so that's how I was able to do it. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting up there. This lake is absolutely beautiful. There's a ton of fountains all around it, and I even saw a couple people taking some boats out in the lake and everything. There's also a lot of turtles and a lot of swans that swim around this lake all the time. I actually always wanted a pet turtle, but the thing is I don't have enough space in my bedroom for one. Uh, if you guys watch my episodes of Joe Winko talk, you'll definitely know what I mean by that. <laughs> However, I'm not exactly sure if this lake has alligators living in it, but it's a huge body of water in Florida that doesn't have a plastic fence built around it, so. So yeah, I definitely wouldn't go swimming in this lake at all. I can't stand alligators, they freak me out. I actually saw an alligator at the park once um, because there's this park in Pinellas County that a ton of alligators live at. But the alligator that I saw, it wasn't really as scary as the alligators that you see in the horror movies. It was pretty big, but it wasn't like gigantic. <laughs> If I wasn't such a germaphobe and if I wasn't so worried about getting in trouble, I actually would have jumped into that water and started wrestling with the alligator. But the thing is, that would have actually been really dangerous. But it wouldn't be too difficult because you can easily hold an alligator's mouth shut. Alligators, they have really strong jaws. Like when they clamp down on you, it's really difficult to get their mouths open. But holding them closed, that's a different story. Alligators actually have really weak jaws if you're trying to hold them closed. But trying to get them open, that's a completely different story. The main point is just don't go into water where you think there might be alligators or crocodiles. Crocodiles are more dangerous than alligators because they're more aggressive, but they're both just as dangerous. So keep away from them. Another thing that I noticed about this lake is that there's actually a walking path that goes along it. It's not a bike path, but a walking path. There's actually signs all over it that say that roller skates and skateboards and bicycles are not allowed on it at all. So it's just for people to walk on. And the length of this walking path is 0.9 miles long and it goes all around Lake Eola bordering it. I think it's pretty cool. So right now I'm standing at another part of Lake Eola right next to this huge Chinese style gazebo that they have built here and for some reason, they actually keep it locked up. I, I don't know why they keep it locked, um, but I'm assuming people aren't allowed inside of it, so your guess is as good as mine. Anyhow, what I was going to say was, I actually read a really scary fact about this lake online. This lake is actually a sinkhole lake. I'm not exactly sure what a sinkhole lake is, but I'm assuming what a sinkhole lake is is when there's a sinkhole and then it fills up with water. And that's how this lake was generated. 
So it obviously wasn't man-made at all. That's actually a really scary thing to think about, really. I do not like sinkholes at all, and I'm pretty sure most normal-minded people don't like sinkholes either. I mean, why would you? Before I moved to Florida, I'd always hear people talk about how dangerous the sinkholes are in Florida, and how, like, if a sinkhole happens, you lose everything. But I never knew much about sinkholes, and because of that, I used to not be afraid of them so much. I always imagined that if a sinkhole ever happened and all of my stuff fell inside of the sinkhole, all I would need to do was just reach in and pull it all out and then go live somewhere else. But the thing is, sinkholes are actually really, really deep. I saw in this one documentary that sinkholes can actually be 100 feet deep. There was actually a guy in Tampa, Florida who was killed by a sinkhole when it opened up in his bedroom. The scary thing was, they didn't even go down there and try to find him at all. They just filled it in. I thought that was really messed up that they did that. I mean, I thought they would at least, like, at least try to find him because he could have still been alive in there. I'm not even sure if they even knew how deep that sinkhole was, but still. I don't really know much about sinkholes, like even to this day I still don't know much about sinkholes, but you think that there would be a way where they can detect where sinkholes are likely to form, like a certain type of x-ray or something, except instead of using it on people, they can use it over the land instead. I mean, I can't believe they never thought of that. They definitely should because that's actually a risk to people's lives and everything. But the natural disasters that I know more about are hurricanes, and that's actually another reason why I like Orlando more than Pinellas County, Florida. The reason why is because Orlando is like literally right in the middle of Florida, so it's away from the shorelines, and when a really powerful hurricane hits, it's not the wind that kills people. I mean, yeah, there are some people who get severely injured and even killed by the flying debris and everything, but 90% of all hurricane victims actually die from the storm surge. And storm surge is when the hurricane pushes water on shore, and it could be really powerful and really destructive. I always thought that storm surge was caused by wind blowing the water on shore, but storm surge is actually caused by the low pressure from the hurricane, which causes the water out in the ocean to rise. But since the ocean is so massive, when the water rises from the low pressure, more water can rush in and replace it. So that's why the water always gets washed onto land. And that's what kills 90% of hurricane victims. For example, Hurricane Irma, which hit Naples, Florida as a Category 3 hurricane back in year 2017, the way that hurricane hit Florida is it made impact into Naples, Florida, but then it ended up coming up the land of Florida, like straight up the peninsula. However, if that hurricane would have came straight up the water along the west coast of Florida, Pinellas County, Florida would have been under 30 feet of water, and a ton of people would have died from that too, because not many people evacuated Pinellas County during Hurricane Irma. The scary thing is, a lot of people living in Pinellas County, they don't even think it's possible for a hurricane to strike Pinellas County. Even though it actually happened 100 years ago, it was the storm of 1924 or 1925. It was a Category 3 hurricane, which made a direct hit to Pinellas County. On Wikipedia, they said that that hurricane only killed eight or nine people, but I honestly believe there were a lot more casualties to that hurricane than eight or nine people. There was actually a rumor that there was a party going on during that hurricane at this bar in Pinellas County and that when the storm surge flowed in, it killed everyone at the party and there were like roughly more than a hundred victims. 
However, they claimed that that didn't happen at all because they didn't find any bodies or anything. But I think it really did. I just think the bodies were all washed away by the floodwaters and everything, and that's why they never found them. But it's really scary. That's why I always prefer to live in inland Florida instead, like in Ocala, Florida, or Claremont, Florida. But I'm not really sure about Orlando. Uh, Orlando, Florida is too populated and too crowded, and I prefer not to live in crowded and populated places. I'm more of a medium-sized town type of person, kind of like the Iowa city I built in the United States of Joe Winko in my SimCity 4 gaming series. I'll have a link to that in the pinned comments so you guys can check it out. So right now I'm on the northern side of Lake Eola and I wanted to show you guys this right behind me. Now right behind me is this stage that they have at the Lake Eola Park. They use this stage, I believe, for like their plays and events and everything. I actually remember when I first got to this park, I saw a bunch of posters everywhere saying that they're having a play here soon for the Nightmare Before Christmas. And I was wondering, how are they gonna do that? Like, this is just a park with a huge lake in it. Or do they have a stage that they drag out to the lake or something? But I'm assuming that they're gonna be doing that here. So, yeah, <laughs> it's pretty cool. I didn't know what it was at first because from the other side of the lake, it just looks like a huge rainbow statue or something, but it's actually a stage. Very clever how they designed it as well. It definitely caught my attention too because as you guys all should know by now, I have a mild form of autism. And because of my autism, I'm really sensitive to bright, saturated colors like all the colors they had on the back of this rainbow stage thing. So yeah, I thought it was cool and I wanted to show it to you guys. So here it is. Okay, so there's also another really cool thing I just noticed at this park. There's a statue right over there of a girl and a swan. And right here is a statue of a book that tells the story of that statue of the girl and the swan. I hope you guys can hear me good. It's pretty windy out here. The Fantasy Swan, sculpture S. Hearth Dale of Thailand, donated by Angie Peretti and Walking Works of Art, dedicated to the city beautiful and all of the Orlando community. On this day of the Regal Swan Foundation, Swan Roundup and Sawyery, October 18th, 2008. The identity of Angie Arts. Once upon a time, there lived a princess of royalty who diligently sought the identity of her soul. And it came to pass one day that all of her dreams came true. She was granted superpowers from the art gods and traveled through time warps and galaxies with her magic pet swan. They landed upon this tranquil crystal pond. On this landing spot, the magic spell ended. Her magic pet swan was transformed back into an elegant black necked swan to ensure the princesses unending happiness. The angel of her soul was released and the princess discovered her true identity. From that day forward, she became immortal to instill artistic inspiration into the hearts of all people from all cultures in the third millennium and beyond. Let the magical aura of this sculpture evoke a moment for soulful inspiration that shall move your hearts to joy. The end of this story now begins inside your own soul. Angie Peretti. I'm not sure how to pronounce that name, but that was absolutely beautiful. I love that statue too. It's really cool. I should definitely try to make that in The Sims 2 and in SimCity 4. 
add it to the United States of Joe Winko. I'm not exactly sure how I would make the water around the statue, but it's something that could be done. I need to look into that. But I'll post pictures of that as soon as I get it done. More goals. <laughs> There's another interesting thing here that I wanted to show you guys, and it stood out to me because I thought it seemed really strange. This right behind me, this is a bronze statue here. This statue is called the Monument in Right Feet Major, and it was donated to this park by these two people named Ford Keen and Jennifer Wigley. And the statue was also made in year 2013, so it's not really that old. That's actually the same year that I started my most recent channel on YouTube, this one channel that you guys are all watching, depending on where you're watching this at, because I also post videos on another site called BitChute also, which I'm trying to get more people to use and sign up for, so I'll have a link to that in the pinned comments. I think this statue is very interesting. I'm not exactly sure what it's supposed to represent, but it kind of reminded me of myself because it's very strange and unnatural, exactly the same way I am. I'm very strange and unnatural. I mean, you can tell the moment you look at me, really. But it's mainly all in my head because of my autism. But life would be so boring if I wasn't autistic, so that's actually one thing that I'm proud of. You'll be surprised how many people don't say that at all. It's kind of sad, really. But it is what it is. Overall, this is a really interesting statue, and I hope you guys liked it. I certainly do. Not sure if I can build that in the United States of Joe Winko, but I'll definitely give it a shot. I mean, I have to now since I said it. So I hope you guys all enjoyed my video of me exploring Lake Eola Park. It's a very interesting place. I really love how big it is and I really love all the cool stuff they have here and the statues and the architecture and the trail around it and everything else. It was very interesting. What was your favorite part of this park that I featured in this video? And have you ever been to this park before? And what's your favorite park in the city of Orlando? And do you live in Orlando? And have you ever been to Orlando? And do you want to visit Orlando? And if so, what part of Orlando do you want to visit? And where in Orlando do you want to visit? And what do you think of the city of Orlando? Personally, I love Orlando because it's safe from hurricanes, but I still wouldn't want to live here because it's too crowded. I'd rather live in the outskirts of Orlando, like in Ocala or Inverness or Claremont because of the mountains. So let me know what you think of everything I featured and discussed and said in this video. Let's get a conversation started in the comments since that's the whole point of all my YouTube videos and I will definitely be getting back to you on all those. So don't forget to like, don't forget to comment, don't forget to subscribe, and don't forget to like me on Facebook and follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr. So that's it. Peace out, people.